Nantes, West France. It's where a new theoretical group has been set up on the Nantes University campus. It's led by Chris Yules. <laughs> He's newly appointed to this government laboratory, the IMN. For Chris, it's a testing time. This is the first contract he has brought to the IMN. It's the project that will make his reputation here. The project started already for me. It started about a year ago when we started to prepare things, but now it's actually kicking off. For a start, that means that I've got money, so I can, um, I can hire Irena, because there's a large empty desk over there at the moment, and it would be nice to have somebody to help out. Uh, my role in the project, it will be modelling um, some of the defects and the nanotubes. And that involves you moving from Sussex to Nantes in France? Yes. Is that a nice idea or a lousy idea? Um, it seems like a nice idea, um, but I don't speak French at the moment, so, <laughs> well, very, very little. Uh, learning it for two months ago, I started learning it. So that's scary but uh, exciting. So the first thing for the project for me is to get that all kind of storytell it. We've, we've got a lot of results and we've got a lot of ideas about what we think is happening, where the atoms are going, how these nanoparticles are moving and forming. But it's, it's quite a step to go from having these kind of slightly woolly ideas to really constructing a, a robust story that tells the whole story of what's going on. I guess being a modeler, does that mean your background is mathematics? My background is chemistry, physical chemistry. Um, and my PhD is in uh, uh, computational materials. Okay, these are some computer-generated images that I've done. Just for fun, really, I've just taken the structures and, and played with them a bit. So, yeah, this is a carbon nanotube. You can see quite well the structure of the tube with the hexagons all the way along its length. These blue dots are the carbon atoms, and these little rods connecting them are meant to be the bonds. It's very um, schematic. But we don't really know, you can't really say what they actually look like at the scale, so it's, it's a fairly arbitrary choice. So blue balls and little grey sticks is as good as anything. So this is it. And these are single-walled carbon nanotubes that have been purified. So these are reasonably expensive. This is about $500, I think. Very, very light, and you can see when you, when you tip them over. See the cloud? Because, because they're so light, they, they descend very, very slowly, which is also one of the um, health and safety issues. They, they rest in the air if you're not careful, so you should always, at the moment, wear masks and things for these. But you can see when they descend, they're very... Um, you probably can't see with the camera. But even after the main ones descend, there's still some tubes left in the air. Right, we want to just talk a little bit about how the calculations are done. And what's the real nitty-gritty, so, so I tell it what the title of the calculation is for me, how many electrons there are, what I want it to do. In this case, I want it to move just a certain number of the atoms, not all of them. Um, and as I scroll down through that, here's a list of all the atoms, one, two, three, four, five, all the way down. And then I've said these are either carbon or hydrogen, they're bonded to these atoms, and here's their position. So it's just a big table of all the positions of the atoms. And that's, all their, that's my initial guess at all their positions, which may or may not be right. So then I run the computer program, I just type in a command and off it goes. And then once it reads it in, It'll chunder away for a day or whatever, and it spits out an output, and here's a typical output. It starts moving all the electrons around, and here it calculates the forces, so it says, actually, in this case, the atoms have got forces away from each other, so I started them too close, and they want to point you apart. So it does the first, first loop round, and it, it moves them apart, and says, right, here's the new energy, and they're more stable. I've done another loop, iteration two, and they're even more stable. In fact, it just took two. So it just moved the atoms until one put found the right distance apart. So I get the final positions. That's a list of the atoms, carbon, carbon, and then nitrogen there. And here's their x, y, z coordinates again. And I've got another program that visualizes these. So it reads in all the coordinates and spits me out a picture. So this is a picture of that, the, those list of coordinates I typed in. According to the sales pitch that you've been granted the money on. It makes a lot of play about finding a gas sensor which will be cheap and revolutionize a lot of gas measuring and so on. But I don't see you as an engineer. What for you is the goal in all this? It w I think it would be nice if we could make some nice gas sensors, but for me that's not the... Not the well, for my personal motivation is not to make gas sensors, it's to understand the chemistry of what's going on and to understand 
exactly how the carbon and the metal are interacting and how the atoms are, are rebonding and how these structures are changing. But you could imagine using nanotubes with other materials like oxides. So just a complete off the top of my head, you could use oxides to trap sunlight and generate electrons and holes. And then the nanotubes could take the electrons away as an electric current. So then you built a solar cell. You've got a kind of nanoscale based solar cell. But in order to do that, you need to understand exactly how these little nano-oxide particles interact with the nanotubes. Will the electrons transfer into the nanotubes or will they stay on the... So the interface, understanding your interfaces at this level, you've got to get, understand all that before you can then really start to develop all these new applications. What's exciting for me, I think, is what we haven't seen yet, that over the three years as we start to understand this more, we'll start to say, oh, well, if this goes on, then maybe we could do this, and maybe this will happen, and there'll be spin-offs. When you get to Nantes, what will be the first things that you have to do in the first three or four weeks? Well, um, in my case, it will be really a lot because um, I have never done nanotubes. Well, I have done very little nanotubes before. So it will involve to get uh, to know the field better. What do you do outside science? Um, well, there's lots of different things. Um, I do singing in a choir. Well, I used to when I was in Sussex and Exeter and also when I was in Paris. But because we're newly arrived in Nantes, I haven't joined anything yet, so that's my New Year's resolution, to find a choir and start singing. And otherwise, I mean, a lot of my time at the moment is taken up with Anna and with the family, because our daughter's two and a half now. And so she's, uh, she's too, too much fun. I could spend a lot of time playing with her and with Flo, my wife. And um, we're doing a lot of DIY on the flat because we've just bought a flat in Nantes and the kitchen is being redone and we're trying to do as much as we can ourselves. So luckily Flo's dad is a bit of a DIY expert and he's training me up because at the moment we've got a whole bunch of holes in the wall where I drill too far through the wall. So <laughs> that's the trouble of being a theorist. I've got to learn some of these practical skills. Both. I wouldn't say we're short of money, but the sciences aren't paid well. And particularly in France, though, I'm paid about, about half of what I was... I was discussing a post in Britain which was twice the pay for here. But it's fine for... Um, for living, because the living costs are lower here and, and we're not particularly extravagant. We've, I, I'm not really motivated by money, I shouldn't say this on film, but <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm doing a job I enjoy and that's the thing that is, is important and I'm earning enough and we're happy as a family. So um, our needs aren't particularly extreme, but of course it would always be nice. It would be nice to get rid of the mortgage and it would be nice to have a bit more financial freedom, but I like the modesty of science as well. And it's, something isn't right or wrong because somebody wants it to be right or wrong or they like it to be right or wrong it's right or wrong because the evidence you compile the evidence together and you say on balance it looks like this is what's going on and these are the things for it these are the things against it it's maybe it's not the clear cut answer that somebody would like you can't, you can't say something's yes with science or something's no with science but you can, it's a kind of rational balanced way of looking at things and I quite like that that you it's a way of cutting through the clutter. So I think I've got an insatiable sense of curiosity. And uh, there's no other job I've found where, if, as soon as you know what's going on, it's finished. Like, when, once you've found out what's going on, then you move on to a new problem where you don't say so you're, you're never on stable territory, never on stable ground. Um, or if, if the science is going well, you're never on it. And that's what I like. Is that always that sense you come into work and think, right, what am I going to find out today? And what does it mean? And how can, I, how can I sort it out? How can I understand what's going on? Tell me about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not married. My parents are still married, and they. My dad is an administrator, and my mom is a secretary. Um, I have one brother, who does uh, computer. Well, he's uh, still in university, um, studying computer science. Uh, in Madrid, I'm from Madrid originally, and I live there. Well, in the suburbs of Madrid all my life until four years ago where I moved to England to do my PhD. And, yeah, that's it. Mm.